Right. So um, maybe uh, we, we continue. Um, so the thing I was thinking about uh, dur during the break is because we have a lot of uh, people here from, well, all of you are from, from uh, physical engineering sciences. So, so one thing, and it'd be interesting to, to compare how, how machine learning is done. So, um, but you see what we're doing in the NLP is, is we, 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 th there is some kind of a very complex system, if it is a system at all, like language, and, and we only we only take some representations of that system, right? So we, we, because we cannot possibly know all the parameters that kind of affect language use, right? And, and, and by extracting some features that we believe are, are relevant or can be extracted practically, on the basis of that, then we, we build our models and our predictions. So, so that might be different from what, what you do um, in physical sciences where you have all the parameters uh, available that you want to put in your model um, uh, or, or maybe not as, as well. So I think these will be kind of interesting questions to, to, to discuss with you. Uh, yeah, um, okay, so we haven't actually done any machine learning yet. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, so I have this one uh, final point about the grounding meaning that we already um, uh, just refer to right so this is uh, grounding normally well grounding means several things but in this context it, it means uh, well ways of associating words with uh, representations of, of of the physical world or images or so on and there is kind of important paper uh, in kind of the cognitive ai uh, spirit from the 90s by uh, stevan harnard and uh, who, who kind of discusses how, how meaning might be connected to the world. And so it talks about sensors, these give us uh, iconic representations. So I understand those as discretizations that the, um, the sensors make. So sensors already make some classifications, right? And then we plug this into a neural network or connectionist network. And this is um, kind of a feature detector creates features. Uh, these invariances from uh, iconic representations and turns them into categorical representations. So these will be words, labels for things, right? Uh, like object detector. And, and then, uh, okay, yeah, we don't, those categories are just probably distributions of features, but then we give them labels and then we end up uh, in, in the symbolic domain. Right, and from these symbols, can we complex more? Uh, where we can make more complicated symbols, uh, and and we, you know we get sentences uh, that we have. So important thing to consider, and this is uh, becomes quite obvious uh, if you if you um, uh, do, for example, robotics, um, is that you get a lot of information from sensors, right, uh, uh, every second, but. You know, maybe those several megabytes of data will then represent just one label on the language side, right? So, so these these arrows become uh, become smaller as we as we reach the symbolic domain. And this is also uh, the problem of of the field because, like, one word may actually correspond to you know several of observations down there. Right, so so that's why the ambiguity is created because you know several sensory observations of a chair. You can take uh, sensory observations of this chair from very different uh, different locations, different time steps. You know, as the robot is moving, but in, in the end, all these classifications will have to uh, will, will will result into one label called the chair. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I already mentioned uh, slam maps. So here is how we uh, represent uh, geometry of the scene. So this is uh, a result of, of the navigation map that was automatically built by this robot that was roaming around the lab. And then as you can see, uh, slam maps are just clouds of points, right? Um, uh, from, but there are 3D points and, and uh, very accurate 3D points. Uh, we also give some labels to these clouds, clouds points here. Uh, so so this, uh, this kind of representation is good uh, for, uh, uh, for geometric reasoning, right? But we cannot really say what's happening with the objects because a table is just like these four sets of, uh, of, 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 of cloud points here, right? So, so you see, 
uh, this robot was very good at, at uh, lo uh, locations. Um, but also, as I said, locations are also tricky. Like you remember on uh, a dog on the grass, uh, you know, a cup on the table. They're quite different geometries there. So um, uh, we also need some information about cups, dogs and grass to decide that that is on. Um, and another kind of representation of grounded, uh, uh, well, and embodied meaning, where you actually take the 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 uh, the, the, the body into account, uh, the uh, the actuators in a robot is is from the work by uh, Deb Roy, who, who is a roboticist and has built several systems where robots learn language from interaction, and and here is a representation that you would have for a word cup. Right, so it's it's a uh, it's a sequence uh, of it's a graph which is a sequence of uh, the detection events. Uh, so if we detect the visual re region, we take a picture, uh, we then analyze the region, and we measure color and shape, and we determine it's a particular color and shape, and then we also have a classifier uh, that and that, that says it's a shape one s one. Then we know it's a cup, right? But this robot can experience the cup in a different way as well, right? It can uh, use the hand contact, and if that is successful, and there's a successful grip, and it can sense the touch, and it's a particular kind of touch, which is stable grip, and and it can you can move the hand to touch it, and then uh, and if it's a success, then we know it's it's a cup. Right. So, so here is what we, we so we have kind of perceptual meaning how representations uh, of, of a cup, uh, what the cup looks like here. But this is kind of the robot's experience of the cup, how it touches it with its uh, uh, robotic hand. Right. Uh, and the location of the sensing here is is fed back to uh, to to determine the location of of the uh, of, of the object. Right. That could be quite tricky because, uh, you know, relating uh, your, your uh, robotic arms location uh, and relating uh, locations from pixels from the image, uh, that, that is not straightforward, right? You're going to need some kind of classification to relate uh, the, those things and estimate the locations. Yeah, so uh, so that's kind of one grounded representation when we kind of build individual classifiers and connect them in some of a graph representation uh, that kind of determines what kind of classifications you need to do. Uh, so your your and the other thing is to analyze images, and for that we most frequently use uh, convolutional neural networks, which you're probably all familiar with. Uh, so. Um, Convolutional neural networks are, are useful for, for this task of detecting what is there in the image because, uh, well, we can connect um, uh, several uh, receptive fields. So these, these, uh, these, uh, uh, this, 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 this square in the matrix is a receptive field that we decided three by three matrix. And, and then we connect those, those units to uh, the same uh, uh, neuron, right? But then we can uh, connect different receptive fields. Uh, we can slide the receptive fields along the uh, along the image, uh, uh, and then we connect. We, we share the weights of of this receptive field or that one. So these weights are the same, and connect it to another neuron, right? So, and and then we end up uh, into a feature map like this, right? So this way we can actually detect the same feature in different parts of the image, right? Because an object would not always occur in the same part of the image or the same feature would not occur in the same part of the image, right? And of course we can control how, how large this receptive field would be and, and the, you know, the amount of overlap between different receptive fields will determine how, how big this feature map will be, right? So convolutions are then so yeah, and each receptive field is is um, is a uh, convolution is then done on each of the receptive fields, right? But kind of uh, convolutions will learn useful features, and the sliding of the feature maps around and and uh, of re receptive fields around on the image will ensure that. Uh, the same uh, feature will be observed. Uh, we can learn uh, to encounter the same feature in different parts of the image. Right? 
Uh, then uh, we can also, so that's kind of uh, the idea of that is to, uh, uh, to, to find the same features in different locations. But obviously we also want to generalize those features, right? So as we saw in that Harnad's map, we have some, we start with pixels and then we gradually build features. Uh, so in, for that, we use uh, uh, the pooling operation. Right, a pooling operation is summarizing those features. Right, we 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 take a certain um, again a certain number of units from a feature map, and we connect it to a single uh, unit in the pooling layer. So uh, so that unit is then summarizing or generalizing those uh, uh, units in the feature map. Uh, we can use obviously different pooling functions like max pooling is. Uh, uh, very popular, which where you take simply take the max value of all those those four units, right? So, um, uh, so I suppose kind of the intuition behind that is that you take the most important, uh, uh, the most salient feature of that uh, of those units in the on the feature map, right? And of course, we can we can then repeat this for several times, uh, and and therefore on each each time you. You 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 uh, learn you learn some features and then you abstract over these features, generalize over these features, and so on. And 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 and, and at the end, you um, you predict the the you you connect all of these to a fully connected layer, which will predict your objects that you want to detect. In this case, uh, letter eight, for example. Right, so we train. We usually train convolutional neural networks in image classification on on the objects. Right, so that's why those those convolutional neural networks uh, uh, that we then save and use uh, in used in new tasks are very good at, de at detecting objects, as as you will see uh, later. But maybe not other things. And and that we really learn interesting abstraction you might have seen examples on 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 on, on the web where uh, we, researchers have tried to visualize what the representations at each of the of the layers in the convolutional neural networks are and really lower layers express low level features uh, like uh, patterns that we encounter but high level layers you know they will start expressing like parts of the body and so on Encoding the biases that we have uh, in 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 the data set, so eyes, eyes and and parts of the body and and so on would would kind of be represented at each um, each of those layers. So an interesting th thing is if you use your convolutional network um, it, as a feature encoder in a transfer learning scenario, which you most normally do, right? You don't train your own convolutional networks. Um, <laughs> the question is. Before cutting off this fully connected layer, you, you take those representations there. Uh, the question is, what kind of representations do you actually get at that point? And, 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 and are, are, they those, are those representations actually useful for the task you want to do? I think this is, this is something that we recently discussed um, in our group. But generally, I don't think people have been used, using convolutional neural networks in a pre-trained fashion in very non-discriminate ways. You just you just load your, your pre-trained model and, and you, we don't really analyze what kind of features they represent. And maybe those are features that you, you, they represent might not be useful for the task you want to do. Maybe you want more low level features, right? Uh, so that would be kind of interesting question to explore. Okay, um, yeah, so um, these are like grounded representations that we use. Um, so uh, seeing geometry with robots, convolutional neural networks for vision, and embodied representations, uh, which is a sequence of classifiers uh, that, that uh, classifies uh, sensory and actu uh, data from sensors and actuators of a robot. Okay, so um, here we then discussed, um, so we know how to then to map words, how to get to the meaning of words, right? Uh, either through the word context or grounding them into some uh, visual representation. But um, we also need to do something about sequences of words, right? Uh, to, to get the representation for the whole sentence or even beyond the sentence, right? 
So uh, here we talk about uh, lang language models, right? And uh, and, uh, and and uh, a language model uh, is is a model that basically estimates the probability of of an upcoming word, like uh, word n, given the sequence of of words uh, preceding. Uh, what is the most likely next word to predict? Or we can estimate the probability of a whole sequence of words. And of course, both of these are related because from, from uh, one, we can estimate two, right? By, by this chain rule, right? So uh, the, the, sequence, the probability of a sequence of words is estimated by the product of probability of its, uh, of its subsequences, uh, like, like this. So, um, there's a lot of work on, on language modeling in NLP using uh, uh, Bayesian approaches, uh, but in, in neural network uh, in neural networks we, we can use uh, an LSTM as as uh, as an approximation of those probabilities, right? So we start uh, with uh, the input to this LSTM is the word embeddings that we can train it like word to vec as I've showed you before, or we can use one hot encoding straight away depending on the task, right? And, and this LSTM will be able to, uh, we, um, we, we, this LSTM is then trained to predict the next word in the sequence, right? And for that reason, we introduce the start symbol, right? So with, uh, we, with, with, we start with the dummy start symbol, and then we try to predict uh, the, the next word. Right, and, and so this will be a softmax over our vocabulary, and 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 then and then of course the hidden layer of this the LSTM will be passed to the next stage with the next input and so on. So so this is how it is trained, right? But when you when you um, when you want to uh, when you want to uh, generate a, a new sequence, you would feed in the most likely the prediction here as the input uh, of, of, of the next uh, word in a sequence. So because we are taking softmax here, um, we, are, uh, we, we, are at, we are actually an approximation of those probabilities that, that I mentioned uh, uh, on, on the previous slide. Uh, yeah, do, do you have any questions at this point? Uh, yeah, so, so we, we use like sequence models for for modeling uh, sequences, right? And and oh, what I forgot to mention here is that um, in addition to in this experiment in, in this paper, we 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 were interested in in how uh, how LSTM would would actually encode this notion of compositionality of 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 uh, of words, namely that uh, you know subsequences. Uh, would, so that the, the meaning of the subsequences would contribute to the meaning of the whole sequence, right? So what we did is we also fed in the visual information, which in this case was very simple. It was uh, it was just the location in 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 a, in a matrix, right? Like uh, a point related to another point in the center of the matrix. Uh, uh, for uh, and for each of those points, we had scores. Like uh, this location. It, uh, you know, this is below, this is above that, right? So we can do an experiment with uh, humans to where we place an object in one of those uh, cells of the matrix, and then and then we collect the scores to what degree this location is above the center location, and so on, right? And um, so uh, and then and then from from those scores, we we generated artificial data set where we turned the frequency. Uh, the, 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 the size of the score to the frequency of examples, right? And then we, um, we generated examples where some descriptions would, would be composed, for example, uh, not below or above left, right? Uh, and, and, and each of those would be, uh, uh, f uh, the location would be the same, right? And the idea was to, uh, in the training data, to uh, in, in, so that the, the test data would contain some of the proportion of sequences that were not seen in the training data. For example, not below was never seen during training, but now we want to uh, predict um, kind of the, the, the likelihood for not below here 
So we, we don't take the top probability, but we take the probability for, for the ground truth for, for not below when we apply this model. And, and then we measure, uh, uh, we measure the, 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 the score, right? So, so how likely is that description for that, uh, for, for that sequence? Uh, so, so we actually show that uh, the model is able to generalize uh, for, for unseen sequences, right? Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and that, that's kind of encouraging results. So the model actually has learned how to compose individual words uh, in, 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 in the testing in environment. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, so um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, in, in this case, we, we, have, uh, we have, we're combining the vision and language just by concatenating them, right? So here is the visual embedding, which is just one hot encoder for the location. And, 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 and here is one hot encoding for a word. Uh, but and and they are just concatenated and then they fed into this LSTM. Yeah. So, so that that is too straightforward, right? But we can do more. So uh, then the attention has been introduced. So um, uh, in in this paper by uh, Shu et al. Uh, on image captioning, right? So uh, the, the idea is to. Um, um, to, to kind of select and combine the visual and textual information and let the network learn how to select and combine this visual and textual information, right? So we have an input image and then we use the pre-trained convolutional network to extract the features. And then we, we have an attention mechanism uh, and this is inspired by human attention that I mentioned earlier. So how do you detect what is relevant in the image? But here, the attention is, is really what relevant to the word that you're predicting when you're generating a description, right? So you're using information that is used to generate the next word, or sometimes the current, uh, the current word, uh, there are different implementations. And you combine that with information on the image, and then you, you basically learn an association between the word and parts of the image. Right, so, so then you successfully learn to associate the word bird with patterns in the image that correspond to birds, like, like this, right? So this, 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 this introduction of attention to image captioning uh, greatly increase its uh, accuracy. Uh, uh, and, 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 and these papers were, or, or, yeah, um, uh, very influential at the time. So, uh, the, in the first paper, so what, what is attention? Um, we simply combine the image features V with the hidden state of the LSDM that you've seen earlier uh, through a single layer fo followed by a softmax, right? So this gives us, uh, uh, so this is this combination, WG, WV are the trained, uh, V is for the image, and this is the hidden layer of the language model that you saw here, right? So. Uh, and uh, we take the tan H and then gives us ZT. And then we take the softmax of ZT, which gives us uh, alpha T, which is our uh, attention map, right? So, so effectively um, that, that would uh, give us for each time in the LSTM when it's unfolding for each word, will give us a distribution of attention over the, over the features of the, uh, of the uh, uh, visual map, yeah. So the, the the dimension of that alpha will be the same as the dimension of, of the feature map of the yeah visual features. Um, and so uh, so then we we yeah we multiply the attention map with the visual features, uh, and and uh, uh, for for the whole uh, K uh, matrix of visual features, and. Um, and uh, I is a, as a region, uh, I is one of the regions of the K regions of the image. So there are K regions in that image. And uh, VI is the visual representations of that region. And uh, alpha TI is the attention weight for that re region, right? And, and, and so when we sum them, when we sum these products together, we get a CT value. And that CT value is then combined with the hidden state of the LSTM to predict the next word, right? So, so you, you, you are then modifying your linguistic 
uh, representation of the language model that you have at this point when you, you're deciding to predict the next word, right? Uh, with, with this attention here. So, so, and the attention is then calculated based on the previous H0 and, and it's mapping to the visual representations which we have here. So, uh, so I think yeah, the idea is, is, is very simple. Um, um, so, but then there was an extension of the attention mechanism pr proposed in the shoe paper, in, in the loop paper, which we liked very much. And, and uh, so, so there they, um, uh, they call it, uh, they extend it to, uh, uh, they call it an adaptive attention, right? So uh, when, when you're creating CT, you're not only basing it on attention alpha on the visual features, but you, 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 you know, you're weighing it between the contribution of CT and contribution of the SD, which is the memory state from the language model, right? So this attention in the Lou uh, approach is, um, is, is not just taking visual attention, how, how words relate to, to the parts of the image, but it's also has the ability to attend also on the language model attention on, on information from the language model, right? And this is important to what I said earlier, because I said, when you describe uh, a scene, you don't use just the visual features geometry, but also what you know about the world. So you say the dog is on the grass because somehow we know this from uh, interactions of dogs and grass. So in English, it's decided that this will be on, right? But uh, geometrically on, we have several versions of geometric ons. So, so this way we can actually consider some information from the visual part to generate the word and some information from the language model, which also contributes to the uh, generation of the description like on or, or, or maybe an object, right? And, and this um, then beta here, so alpha is here inside the CT as, as before. Uh, but this beta is then, you know, it's a complementary, so they sum up to one. So the so some so when you generate the next word, sometimes you attend more onto the on the vision side, sometimes you attend more uh, on on the language side. And and we got really excited when we saw these attention maps because, uh, as I said, my my previous interest was was how do we describe space and. And, and therefore, wow, we really need to test how attention is related to uh, describing space, right? So what we did, we, uh, we, we again, we trained like a, a, like a language model that you, I shown you before here, more sophisticated uh, on image captions and images uh, rather than those uh, uh, geometric um, abstract locations. Uh, and, and then we measured attention, what's happening in different descriptions. So, um, a uh, dog jumping over grass. So dog is the target, grass is the landmark, right? And and here you see what, uh, yeah. So, and, and what we, what, 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 what you have shown is that um, um, attention is really, it seems to be very good like at lo localizing the objects, right? Uh, but it's not, um, and, and this is like grass is down there. This is probably, uh, uh, you know, dog or something like that, right? Over and, uh, but when it comes to a spatial relation, it's, it's, you see, it's kind of exploding here in the middle. Uh, and, 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 the, uh, and the same here for, uh, for, for under, right? And actually our theory was that over and under are slightly different, that under is more dependent on geometry than, uh, the, uh, the, the, than, than over. Uh, uh, and, um, but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, as you can see, they, 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 they are both a bit unfocused, right? And, and really, um, uh, then when you generate a spatial relation, you, you, you don't depend that much on the visual information, probably, because it's unfocused attention, right? So, uh, so it looks like uh, when a language model is predicting these spatial relations, it's not relying on, on, on the vision, it's more relying on the language model. Right, uh, and that's that's kind of an important question. So, 
uh, well, it's no surprise because as I said, the way the CNNs are trained, they are trained to detect objects, but not relations between the objects, right? Or actions that happen between the objects. So, and therefore the language model kicks in, like what are the most, most kind of frequent relations between those uh, those those objects. So those, those predictions you, you would have. A question, Simon? Uh, yep. So maybe for, maybe, I mean, uh, you don't, maybe you don't need the sort of the attention on the central object there over or under because it's contained in the landmark uh, attention mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, so so definitely uh, uh, you have the comparison between the red and the blue already that indicates whether it's over or under. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but I, I would say the other way around. It's actually that these attention patterns are not that clear because precisely because some objects are uh, contained in others, right? Oh, you mean here like um, uh, like like like. Uh, so, so there would be some kind of partial containment in both of those cases, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so, so this is just uh, you. You don't get like a really clear uh, attention maps, but uh, you, because of precisely because what you mentioned. But still, we can see that the attention is really looking at the objects more, but it's kind of not really doing much on the relations. Yeah. Uh, because in our case, in this experiment, the attention exploded over the entire scene. But actually, if you look at the loop paper, the, the, it kind of implodes when it kind of reaches the descriptions that are not part of the object. It kind of, you know, like the big brown dog, you can nicely see the attention preparing and going up when you start to generate the, the noun phrase, but then is jumping over, I think it will drop and, and, and um, and then it will start rising when you start predicting the next uh, uh, noun phrase. So, so the attention was is is really about the noun phrases, and 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 you know our conclusion was well, this is because the way the uh, the neural network was uh, was trained, uh, the pre-trained for to detect objects and how what kind of information those CNNs encode. I, I said the wrong thing actually earlier. So over and under, they are both words that we hypothesize that would be more influenced by world knowledge, right? And therefore language model. Whereas above and below are those that are more uh, geometric. Uh, and I think in the paper, we did notice a, a, a difference, right? But overall, uh, yeah, the, the, the visual information is maybe not that good for spatial relations. So this kind of led us to another experiment where we actually um, help the network with features a bit, right? So in order, to, in addition to giving it um, a full image representation of the entire image or visual features of the entire image, we also explicitly extracted um, uh, b b bounding boxes of objects, the targets and the landmark, and those were the visual features of the bounding boxes. And then we also uh, extracted the geometric relations between those bounding boxes, right? So, so th we, th we did the, that for, uh, from the annotated corpus, right? And, and then also we have the lang information from the language model. Now, uh, order means uh, here that we ordered the target and landmark that, you know, in this long vector where we concatenated the features, we always had the target features there and then the landmark features, like the objects were, were ordered. And S means that we also had spatial features, right? And um, so here you can see how, how the attention worked. So actually, uh, you know, having uh, targets always in the same part of the vector obviously helped to uh, find the elephant in the beginning of the description. Uh, but then uh, next to, it also considered some spatial features, which we were very happy about, but also quite a lot of language information features, but not much uh, much uh, target and landmark. But you can see here, the network is trying to prepare to generate 
the the landmark. So the blue the blue fe features uh, uh, receive more attention uh, than the the pre uh, than than the than all the rest, right? So um, so that's kind of an interesting result. Um, uh, so it, some some geometric information is considered. Objects are identified with uh, as targets and 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 landmarks, uh, and uh, the language information still has quite an important role and maybe too strong uh, in, in in generating that in the sequences. Um, and the other thing is that maybe. Um, the attention patterns don't really correspond to how humans analyze the scene. So, so it looks like we start, it's kind of syntactically biased. So you start with, a, you, you attend on the appearance of the target, and then you start attending on the appearance of the landmark. But usually, well, maybe you, 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 you start with um, a, a target and a landmark, and then you choose how to describe it, right? So, so, so that is not uh, in the same way as um, as what you need to attend when you generate a sequence. So we also reversed the the descriptions in one of the experiments. We said, you know, elephant rocks next to, and then. Or, or rather rocks, elephant next to. And then we measured kind of the perplexity of the language model. And the perplexity of such language model was uh, on, 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 on measuring such sequences uh, later on in the test set was much lower than the perplexity of, of, uh, of the order in which the natural human descriptions uh, come. So Simon, I think that-, that you, you keep track of time. I don't know if you plan to go through all 51 slides. Oh, so just a yes, a couple of minutes. <laughs> so um, maybe I should I should wrap up and I, I will leave the slides with you, but just maybe briefly describe uh, other experiments and then answer any questions you might have about them. So. So, yeah, from 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 this, we then went on to asking questions. Uh, so here we are generating only single descriptions in this work with uh, one of my PhD students, Nikolai, we look at what, how can we then generate paragraphs, not just individual sentences, right? So here you also get a problem that the same things might be re-referred again, right? And, and, and you know, might use pronouns and so on. Uh, so you need to select the visual features of objects and then you also need to know background knowledge about the objects and situations. And then you also need to consider how to structure this paragraph. Right. So, what information to mention first, and what information to, to mention last? And then, again, here we use attention to to uh, combine um, information about objects and descriptions of objects, which we get as word embeddings. And then we use this kind of double layer LSTM, one that is encoding individual sentences here, uh, and this is expanded to that, and one that is encoding like sentence sentences within paragraphs that would kind of distribute that information and then um i thought i also should mention um this highly influential work recently that you might have heard about attention and transformers right and and the idea of transformers is that you just generalize this notion of attention and you you uh you 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 create um uh, you, you have several attention heads that are distributed over several layers of a fully connected network, right? So it's basically just having more attention that we have in these models. Here we have attention implemented here, right? Uh, on this concatenated vector, but now uh, imagine you have a model where, with several attention heads, right? All over several layers. So you, you can encode through attention much more uh, sophisticated information. This was the model by Waswani uh, of the transformer originally. And, and then this was implemented among others in a large pre-trained model called BERT that you hear a lot about it nowadays, right? Uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a very large model. Um, so it has 340 million parameters in the BERT large. Uh, and and uh, it's been trained in, in this attention Waswani style as, as, as a pre-trained model, and it's been trained on a very large corpora of text. And 
and, and now it's being used as, as a feature code for the semantic knowledge in, in most uh, NLP tasks. So I know also uh, several groups in Sweden are working on, on the Swedish transformer uh, models and, and they're already available so you can use them in your uh, application. So, so this takes a lot of time and energy to train, right? And uh, then the pre-training is kind of uh, cool because you you only need for your task you only need to add like one final layer in the transformer uh, and and then just fine tune the that uh, that layer for for your task so um, um so here we have we take input two sentences and we pre predict a class label uh uh, for if it's if one sentence uh, entails or is inferred by the other and so on here we can generate sequences uh, in, in between from two sentences like taking a question a paragraph we we generate an answer so bird can be used in both of those scenarios yeah finally i wanted to say something about the work with it on interaction um and maybe just that, so th this is kind of our early experiment with Kinect. Uh, it's a followed up the master thesis uh, where a tutor is uh, teaching the system through interaction incrementally what these objects are. And the goal, we, well, what we try to show is that um, the interaction strategies that the tutor takes, they're not just mere presentation, but different interaction strategies can speed up the learning. So the goal was how to integrate interaction strategies and different classification methods, right? Then um, we, we uh, so and, and the problem here is learning from very few examples, right? So here we use some kind of clustering of visual features. Then we also tested this uh, Vignal's model uh, for few shot learning. Uh, and integrated it in this uh, interactive uh, scenario uh, with uh, question answers to the robot uh, and, and the, uh, using a pre-trained convolutional network as well. So the idea was the effect of the background knowledge. And now we are working on, uh, on embodied question answering, um, which, is, um, uh, which is a task where you ask a question to a robot and the robot r finds its way through navigation through the environment like what color is the car it finds the car and then answers a question called orange so here we are using uh, virtual environments there's a really cool uh, virtual environment or virtual robot called habitat uh, developed by facebook ai and and and, and others and uh, um, yeah, you get basically sensory readings of a, of, of a robot roaming through this photorealistic uh, uh, room. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So again, you will see CNNs and LSTMs for navigation and quest classification generation for question answering that I also briefly mentioned earlier. Yeah, so I'll briefly finish. So um, I hope I gave you some idea why learning language is challenging, but also very exciting. And I try to kind of show you some uh, representations and approaches that we that we uh, commonly use. But there's also um, some very interesting open questions. So how do you represent knowledge? Um, so how do we encode the knowledge that we need, like knowledge about the world, visual features, and so on? How can we transfer knowledge between different pre-trained models? So can we use the image captioning pre-trained model in a robotic setting to recognize objects in this virtual environment, for example? An important thing when you talk about large pre-trained models is social bias and ethical concerns, right? And uh, so it has been shown that such models kind of encode a lot of undesired social bias. They're also very expensive to train environmentally wise, right? So there was a very interesting paper by uh, uh, Emily Bender and, uh, and others that kind of stirred a lot of attention recently uh, because Google objected to some of that research presented in that, that paper. And um, yeah, things that we're working on is information representation and fusion, like exactly how to make, you know, uh, geometric features count there. Uh, can we supply other features like that to make the learning better for individual words? And then the last thing is um, 
interactive learning and learning from very little data. So how do we adapt these machine learning algorithms that we saw in image captioning to uh, in a scenario with robot where you know you don't have a large data set to train. So um, yeah, all of these are possible thesis topics. Um, I don't know how you have your, your thesis uh, uh, procedure set up in your departments, but uh, I would be happy to discuss uh, you know, possible collaborations uh, with, with your departments and supervisors from your departments for, for any potential uh, uh, thesis topics if, if you might be um, in, interested. Yeah, I think I'll stop there now because I'm already over time. Um, uh, I might, uh, but I'll be around uh, to take a question or two uh, later on. I have one question again. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that you're always looking at the, the images to, to create context. I'm just one well, kind of this may be a wild idea. Is it possible to use this way? To, to understand why a model gives the result that, that let's say you, you apply the CNN and you get the result what you want. But can we put this the, this way in the middle and say, we get this result because these parameters are being fed to the model. So somehow understanding, so get the understanding of them, what causes the result you get. So, because it's a very hard thing to do. So it's somehow use this approach to put it in the middle of the, the things and see what are the features being fed. So it gives you this, it gives you that importance because of this and this. So write it like a natural language processor. So understand what it's been fed, relation between the targets and the, the, the features and gives you the result. The somehow it's trying to explain the result by this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a really good point that you mentioned, and there's a lot of work on, on this. So explainability of language models, right, and, and image uh, models. Right? So, so yeah, you can engineer the input and then you see what the outputs uh, will be. This is what we did, for, for example, when we, when we reversed the, uh, the objects in, this, in, the, in the description. Right, and then you you can measure either the state of the way of the activations at different layers in the in the network, or you can uh, you can um, measure how good a system is in some uh, task uh, for let's say classifying uh, uh, another label, right? Or you can measure in case of language models, you can measure per 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 perplexity, right? So you, we train the language model on original strings that we found in the data set, but then we permutated the strings and then measured perplexity, what's, what, what, what would, how would that affect uh, the, the language model? Uh, but yeah, the, there is an interesting uh, area now in NLP kind of interpretability. People were hoping that uh, deep learning will uh, reveal grammatical rules that, you know, NLP uh, historically has also been rule-based, right? So where we, we wrote, um, and, and still is in cases like dialogue systems, right? Or Siri and things like that. People still prefer rule-based systems. So, so uh, there was a hope that a lot of interesting linguistic intuitions would get out of the representations. And, and, and what it came obvious that neural networks learn quite different representations in many cases. And, and at the examples that we looked at, it looks like that this is because also the architecture that you choose uh, influences that, right? So in that case, we chose an LSTM. LSTM can only go left to right. So we can only encode left to right dependencies. But as I said, maybe in, in a spatial description, knowing what the landmark is, uh, it's, then it will be easy to describe the target. But in the sequence, the landmark comes last, right? So. The LSTM still works well, but it's forced to work harder than it should be uh, because having information about the landmark, yeah, it's much easier to, to predict. The, the perplexity really drops to, uh, in, in, in that uh, language model uh, for uh, pre predicting all of the, the descriptions. Yeah, yeah um, but, but oh, I'm still also interested in the, the other thing is like, it's, can, can, a, can we learn from? They said, because um, as a physicist, we will be, they said, we always want to study the relations with the formulas or whatever that we want. Until now, it's always the deep learning, whatever, it just gets some result. Is it possible, again, to use natural language process to look at the, the features that are fed to this, uh, the fully connected layer or, or even that one and suggest that 
those might be relations that you kind of the formulas that could be interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. We always get some result, but we don't know why we get, or is there any kind of generalization? It will be, I know it's a bit wide question, but mm -hmm. I'm trying no. to understand is there a way. No, no, and that's a really, really good point. So, so exactly, yeah. So we are also interested in, 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 in this aspect, right? So, uh, because that, that was kind of the first attempt. So what can we say about the language? Can we discover things about the language? Right, and then we saw sometimes we get a different representations, but we do. So if we maybe if we restructure the the learning task experimentally in such a way, we do get important information. So there is, for example, work now on. Uh, uh, well, we did it for like prepositions. So we were actually saying there are different classes of semantic classes of spatial relations, and we need different models from them. But we're constructing examples like this. So, so. Um, but the problem with these experiments is that um, you, you, because it's such a general model, there's always, and because there might be other factors influencing your, uh, your, your, your task, you, your, your, the, 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 you know, the behavior of the network might be capturing something else. But I, I guess if you sufficiently uh, limit the structure of the model, that you you know what you might be expecting to, to learn, and also, also if you use synthetic data that you generate for a partic particular purpose, yes, then then I think you can learn a lot about language or physics about from from the behavior of the network. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for a good question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Simon, for a very interesting.